at one time, my mother and I were in a bomb shelter. We came out and everything was level. You can lose all your possessions, but what's in there, that's important. If you think it's so bad in the United States and you don't like the government or whatever, go live under communism. Girls would come into the classroom and with the styles that they have nowadays, so I would turn up the air conditioner. <laughs> and they say, and they say, Senora Herza, this it's cold here. I said, I know it. There's something wrong with the air conditioner. <laughs> I said, why don't you bring a little jacket? You go first. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> you go first. Okay, I'm gonna go first. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited today. Uh, we have in studio the mother of one of our employees or team members, uh, the general manager of Odyssey, Jonas. We call him Jonas Herzog, but uh, but he I know his Lithuanian name is Jonas. And uh, I am pleased to introduce you to Grazina, who speaks seven languages, came from uh, immigrated from Lithuania. She's going to tell some stories about um, escaping Lithuania and the German army and all those kinds of things. And the more when I've met you and, and heard these stories and Jonas has told me stories about you, I'm like, we got to have her on the podcast. <laughs> like <clears throat> in the spirit of you go first, you have gone first to be a pioneer in so many ways, not only as a mom and a grandma and an educator, you've been in education for some 50 years teaching Spanish and Russian and French. Uh, and so I'm privileged to introduce all of you to Grigina, Jonas's mother and the grandmother, of course, of, uh, of his children and just an awesome, awesome influence. We're so blessed to get to work with Jonas. Thank and you. I just want to know more about how you became you and how that led into Jonas. So can you start us at the beginning? Here you are. Uh, and if you don't want to give away your age, that's fine. You can just say a long, yeah, long I'm, time ago, I was born in Lithuania <laughs> and this is what it was like. But can I'm, you tell I'm us a little bit? I'm fine with my age. I'm 85. <laughs> and the, the set, I'm cutting it off at 90. That's it. That's when you're going <laughs> to stop revealing. Okay. So you, you're 85 years ago, and that's actually the same age as my father, so that's very cool. Uh, you're born in Lithuania. What was it like? How many brothers and sisters? And what do you remember from your childhood? Just a, a few snippets. And then, of course, the, the day, the, hey, we're moving, we're, we're escaping Lithuania. And just give us a snapshot in that. And then, of course, we'll fast forward to like as an educator and what you see in the world right now and pass along some of your wisdom. And I'll, yes. I'll walk you through those things as okay. much as I can. Okay. So talk about your childhood. As a, I was eight years old when I found out my sister and my brother came in and told me to pack a little suitcase. We're leaving because the Russians are coming to get us. My father was in jail from... Uh, 39 to 42 and he was uh, going to be executed in 42 by the Russians and in the morning the Germans pulled the Russians back and he was saved he came back to us after spending you know the two years in jail and uh, so my um, because my father was so against Russians and communism we were on the list to be deported to Siberia. And my sister and my, my uh, brother decided that we have to leave. So we just left, we had a farm, we left everything behind, just got a suitcase, got into a um, covered wagon type we had and a horse, and we left Lithuania, pulling away with the German army. Like following you behind, like just yeah, in the nick of because time. Because we were not uh, Jewish, they let, let us go. But if you're a Jewish, you couldn't do that. And many of the Lithuanian people who left Lithuania this way, uh, were the Jewish people were giving their children away, say, take, take them as one of you. Wow. So, so they were saved from the Russians. So you're the baby of the family, the darling child yeah, probably. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, so and your brother I... and sister decide this? Your your yes, father because is my, my my father had passed away a year before. Uh-huh. He and he came from the jail, lived for a year and then he passed away. It was just you and your brother and sister working this farm? What were you farming? My my mother was far the farmer. Oh, okay. And when my father was in jail, they they sent me away to my grandma's house. And my uncle, 
And there I got an education. My uncle was very much into cussing around. So I'm, oh, I was at that time six years old. And after a couple of months there, they picked me up. And the, I came out with cuss words that they were just absolutely <laughs> shocked, which they never cussed. You know? you, now, and, I heard you say cussing around. I'm like, yeah. okay, so that's an eighth language. Then you learned, uh, <laughs> you learned the, the sailor's language of cursing. Or, or the ninth language when I was working in a Bisco ca- uh, factory in the summer in Chicago, and I got education there also <laughs> with the English language. Oh, my anyway, goodness. Anyway, so that's where it was. Um, so I packed my doll, things that were important to me, and my brother and sister and my mom packed documents and pictures because we can only put this in the suitcase what we can carry. Yeah. And I, in my teaching, I used to tell my students, this is all in Spanish class, I said, okay, your parents come in and say, we have to leave in an hour. Pack your suitcase. And what would you put in it? So it was quite exciting. And you know, wow. you look at your students, and you, some look like they're not even paying attention. And then you go, the back to school night comes, and the parents say, oh, we had an interesting conversation about your life. <laughs> you know, that was oh, very interesting. Yeah. So that connection with students is very important. Yeah. Anyway. Well, you know, in this era, we are so, we have so much. Yes. Um, and I wonder if our listeners out there, you know, if they really thought, okay, you have a half hour to pack everything you want to really value in a bag and yes. we're leaving. Yeah. The Russian army is coming. The German army is coming. And you're squeaking out in the yes. middle here yeah. saying, yeah. we're going to America. Yeah. Did yeah. you know you were going to America at this point or you're just, we're getting no, out of Lithuania? No, no, no. If we're just leaving Lithuania for a couple of weeks till the war was over. Uh huh. And here we are. That's so many years some, later. Uh, let's see, 70. You know, and they have written books now, later. which people say, uh, uh, expressing their experience of leaving for just temporary and people uh, digging uh, in the ground and putting their documents there and all thinking in two weeks we'll come back and we'll recover uh, it. Wow. And we still have not come back. And then, of course, all the all the property and everything was made into the coal hose, like uh, the Russian farmers that, and and took all the properties away and just made, you know, a commune for, for the Russians. You know, I, I appreciate this story because, you know, here we all think, oh my gosh, this is the worst the world's ever been and this is so terrible. And, I, and the world has been through some terrible things. I mean, this is... First of all, you activated the treasure hunter in a lot of people just now that are like, wait, people were burying all their valuables in their hearts. Okay, Lithuania has to be metal detectors everywhere. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, we've been through a lot. The world has been through a lot. These terrible times, this yes. Russian, German, yes, Lithuania, yes. these conflicts. And somehow you squeak out just in the nick of time. How do you get from being, uh, you know, uh, really sneaking out to then, when did you come to America? How did you get here? A boat? Okay. Or how does that work? So we, from there, we came, the horse and buggy we had to sell. We had a cousin who lived in uh, Linz, Austria, so we all g- gathered there. And then they found jobs. My mother, for example, ended up in working in the Nazi, uh, um, not restaurant, Nazi for the Nazi army uh-huh. in the, re- in, like the, uh, the, the, the mess hall food. or whatever. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, and uh, any food that was left over, my mother could bring it home. So she fed us through that, you know, wow. and, and, and so that's what was first. And then after the war, uh, we were put in a different displaced person camps and we ended up in Schwäbisch Gmünd, the part of Germany. And for the kids, it was fantastic. All our friends were next door into the, because we were in German army barracks. So my friends were right next door to me, next room over. Yeah. In our room, for example, uh, four families lived there, separated by blankets. That's the only privacy we had. But again, as a child, it was fantastic. Because you're with your friends. You don't really feel this. The, the weight of this historical, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, we're yeah. escaping from history. And for our non-historians out there, the war was over. Which war are we talking about? Second World War. Okay. <laughs> and, and now we're running from the Germans and the Russians, but we're working in the German oh, cafeteria. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. there's 
pocket the so safety? That, again, Did you feel if you your were life not was in Jewish, debt? you could work in those uh-huh. places, and they were, you know, accepting people, and, and you could, you know, and my cousin who had lived there, he found different jobs for my sister and my brother. Mm-hmm. What a, so. what a reality, just that you say just so plainly if you weren't Jew, Jewish, because if you were Jewish, you would be killed. You would be... Exactly. You could not, like, as I said, you know, the Jewish uh, families, they, they saw what was coming. So they said, okay, you're leaving. Take my son or my daughter as your own. Uh, for example, the, the dentist in Chicago, lived in Chicago for many years, uh, was Jewish, and she was saved by, by a Lithuanian family coming alongside a family, and yeah. they would just say, "Oh, and that's as, our, as their that's daughter, our... and 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 you know, starting her life there." I mean, I, I just we're sitting in Northern California right now. Uh, you know, there's lots of like you get on social media and like, oh, the world's coming to an end. And yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And the thought that if there was a group of people in California, and certainly there are groups that are discriminated against and all that, but there's no group that's like. If they know I'm part of this group, they will round me up and kill me. And, yeah, and that's just yeah. the reality. You say, yeah, yeah, like that's how it was. And, and what an amazing, like those families out there that took those people in at risk to their own lives, probably because they were Absolutely. harboring Absolutely. an enemy of the state or who, whoever was out to get them. Um, and so many people was, putting their lives and they were lives. running, they were risking their lives too, you know, accepting them, but they made it through. It's amazing how pe- what people do to get through life. Yeah, and and it's you can do it. You can do it. Yeah, you have an example here. <laughs> yeah, and, and and she's posturing and to her son Jonas, who's in the room with us here. And <laughs> yeah, and when we were first talking today, you mentioned that the, the, the struggle in life, and Jonas has been obviously helping his wife Nani with breast cancer and everything that flows from that with his family. Oh, and what do, you um, know, everything is on his shoulders, and he's done beautifully. Yeah, they've all done beautifully. You know, we prepare for these battles without even knowing we're preparing yes. for them often. Yes, and yes. And these qualities that were in you as a young girl that were probably just magnified as you escaped. And now as you support your your son and his grandchildren yes. and his wife through this. Oh, yes. It, it's, you know, that is my my support. My I dedicate my life to that because it's important you know, to help them out. Mm-hmm. So when we, uh, after the war, we lived in displaced person camps. And afterwards, you know, they were saying, okay, we have to find some way to to start life all over. Uh, Australia was the first ones, uh, first countries to offer shelter for us. And we were signed up to go to Australia. In the meantime, I had a cousin who was Franciscan monk and he was, the monastery was in uh, Kennebunk Port, and he found a Lithuanian, older Lithuanian lady who said, okay, I'll sponsor your family. So uh, if you had a sponsor, you could come to the United States. So we came with on the, under uh, Omar Bundy, the warship, and, uh, and we came to New Orleans. But our destination was Kennebunk Port. And of course, at this time, I'm thinking America, castles and princesses. In America. <laughs> in America. <laughs> and we'll pull in Mississippi Bay. Where are the castles? <laughs> Where are the castles? <laughs> okay, anyway. you just covered some stuff for me. Okay, so we think we're going to Australia. We get a sponsor. What are we talking about? Ten dollars for a family, or any idea how much that costs to sponsor you to to find yourself in Mississippi? It was like uh, hundred sixty dollars. And somebody who do you know who sponsored your family? No, just she a, just, my cousin who was a monk knew her through the parish, and she was willing to sign up. And he said, "I'll be responsible for whatever expenses you have, but as long as they have that sponsor." ticket you know we were okay people talk about moments where your life changes australia yes. or mississippi yeah <laughs> and, and somehow like how different would your life be if it had been australia and i know without even knowing or if you hadn't and, left when you did and hadn't and you know the lithuanians and all the other nationalities they went whatever they could to start life anew yeah and they knew they had to find something to do yeah and as I, I said to Jonas, and I used to say to my students, what you learn, what you put in your head, nobody can take away. Mm. 
You can lose all your possessions, but what's in there, that's the important thing. Yeah, wise words. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, you know, like I had students that uh, in the 60s and 70s would not say the Pledge of Allegiance. And I would talk to them outside. They said, if you think it's so bad in the United States, and you don't like the government or whatever, go live under communism. And then come back how beautiful it is there compared to <laughs> what you hate in Palos Verdes. <laughs> you know, they come from rich families, yeah. well-to-do, and they just don't, don't know what's happening in the world. Yeah, well, so. I appreciate that. You know, I've, I've started a thought of like what, not who, because I think a lot of our, our political environment is about who, 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 and yeah. really what. And what you're talking about is like what is America? What could it be? You know, not who's pledging the who isn't, but really what does it stand for? Like you said, it's communism or it's this level of freedom that you were... Exactly, the freedom that, that we have here. And I love this country. And, and the, my friends who have come over feel the same way. You know, this is our life-saving country. We have, we, for example, in, in high school, uh, after I finished high school, I went on to the University of Illinois and studied languages and other subjects. And... Um, our five-year reunion, high school reunion. The American girls came back with three kids. And we, the, the displaced person people who were for education, came, all, came back with masters. <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite interesting uh, yeah, you know, to see that. Well, well, like you said, and, and I think in that time, which obviously my mom is probably a part of that era of like, you know, you... You got through high school, you would get married, you would yeah, have some yeah, kids, you would start yeah, your white picket yeah. fence and all that. And like you said, like what we put into our mind is ours and really the value and the opportunity education brings. And you found yourself not only learning to curse, congratulations, <laughs> <laughs> and you, you've, you somehow, you speak seven languages, so you just picked up these languages and you, and you, you have know, your master's and then you start teaching. And so you spent so much of your life giving people the gift of knowledge and education uh, what do you see then versus now as far as the value of education? I'm glad I'm not a teacher anymore. Mm -hmm. Because I don't see the, the, the installation of love for this country hmm, that we need to see. Interesting. You know, like my friends and I talk about that and we say, okay, we'll live through it. What will happen to our grandkids? What are we teaching now in 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 the in the schools? What we hear in the news? So I have a heavy heart for that, mm -hmm. and I hope that things work out and and find a good, wonderful way to solve all, all mm -hmm. what we have to go through. Yeah, it's certainly a challenging time. I think, you know, here you are as a small child immigrating to a country. You think there's going to be castles, you know, yeah. and you think it. And in modern day, there would be no mystery. You would just check on your Instagram or on your Facebook or on your whatever, and you go, oh, no castles. You know, like, we, we're almost overwhelmed with the amount of information, and there's this innocence that the I think The technology is that it has taken over the world, you know, and that it has some good points, but also has brought in many questionable points, mm -hmm. you know, that it's hard. Well, like you said, not only to be a teacher, but to be a kid. Yeah. And now, you know, from COVID to social media to mental health and law and all the challenges that they're facing are so different than. And you know how some of the students, especially in special ed and all, they need this everyday exposure to, to in classroom. And look who they've been, you know, steered away from it mm -hmm. and not receiving it. And it's harmful. Well, let's flash to you as a, so you find yourself here, you become a professor. Where were some of the places where you were an instructor? If I... I started in Peoria, Illinois. I, did, I was going to be a diplomatic secretary, <laughs> but the head of the department came and talked to me and offered me an assistantship to get my master's and teach. Uh -huh. And so that's where I started to love teaching. And here are, I'm, I get into the classroom and there are Korean veterans sitting there. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> but I just loved it. That's the first, like uh, Jonas will ask me, how did you, be, you know, love the, your job? 
I just fell into it. It, it just, you know, life yeah. happens. Mm -hmm. Why I was going to be a diplomatic secretary, and here comes the head of the Spanish department and offers me an assistantship. <laughs> so, you know, he steered me sort of in yeah. that way. Well, that's another fork in the road. And I think one of the challenges of young people today, and maybe you can speak to this, is that they have... They have so many forks in the road to choose from. Yes. That it's oh, absolutely, I think, overwhelming. Like here you thought, oh, I'm going to be a diplomat. And oh, now I'm going to do this. It wasn't like I could do this, 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 this. There's a thousand different things I could do. What could I do? I could live anywhere in the world. I could do it. You know, just kind of being present enough to recognize the choice that's in front of you and then analyzing that choice and, and, and making it. So that Peoria was looking for a Spanish teacher, even though I didn't have my teacher credential, they hired me and then I studied to get my credential approved mm -hmm. in Illinois. And in 63, I came out to California on a vacation. And I thought, why would I be living in Chicago? <laughs> Sorry, any listeners from Chicago. It is, <laughs> does get cold place. there in California. Because, and nice. the reason we live in Chicago, because of the people that have come before us. You know, you sort of uh, look for your own group, your mm -hmm. own people. To, to uh, you, you know them or you you have acquaintance. And, and this is how you form and you stay mm -hmm. and, and, and all that. Yeah. And how did, so you, how did you learn all these languages? Just did you formally okay. study them or you just My, knew people? I spoke. And... Um, we had a Russian maid who was, uh, and I was four years old, five years old. And as I said to, to Jonas, um, I just had that gift from God for languages. I just picked it up very fast. I even made up my own language to speak to my adults. <laughs> but my father was a linguist. He spoke uh, German, he spoke Russian, he spoke Lithuanian, he spoke Yiddish, you know, accent and all that. So he. I, that's where it, it's in my genes. Yeah. And this one has a good ear for languages. And so does Kai. You know, so it's uh -huh. it's it's passes on for yeah. that. And that's something that I've always loved. Now you you mentioned uh, you, you're the doll that that was one of your cherished possessions. Yes. Do you still collect oh, dolls. Is my, that still a thing for my you? My like godfather a, gave me that. Uh -huh. And I was, I packed that. I brought that along. And since we're going to America, there were little girl next door like I said in in the room next door and I said well I'll give her the doll and I gave her the doll and in two minutes the arms were gone the legs were gone I was ready oh my to cry <laughs> <laughs> my precious doll that uh, was so precious to me uh -huh. you know and do you, do you still collect dolls like does, is that still a thing for you it's fine if you if, don't I'm just curious if if I what do you collect dolls still? No. no, no. Well, I, I do have uh, Lithuanian dolls in, in Lithuanian costume. Uh -huh. And I, I collected those to give to my grandkids. So I have given it to Miley. And I still have another one for Miley. And I'm saving one for Kai. Uh -huh. and, for his wife or whatever. <laughs> now, you know, you just let the cat out of the bag. If that's a secret, he's going <laughs> to no, probably okay. watch this. That's okay, okay, good. <laughs> So, you know, you've taught for so many years and in the in the short amount of time, in the spirit of you go first, like we're trying to help people in those choices. You know, you were at a fork in the road going, okay, am I going to be a diplomat? Okay, I'll speak. And the courage to go first and step into the unknown, I think, is just overwhelming for people. And it just was love at first sight for me. And I loved working with high school age and they used to call me mother and so forth. And, and they had different um, uh, students in PV from different years. There were some Chinese, some Japanese, some Korean, uh, and some um, uh, Persian students or from Iran. And I could work with all those personalities, mm -hmm. and they're different. And also, if I go to Bar Mitzvah and I hear Hebrew, and I tell, told my friend, I said, what is Baruch Adonai mean? She says, how do you know that? I said, I heard it. She said, how can you hear it? Yeah. Like I, I used to call the Korean uh, parents at home, and they wouldn't say hello. they say, Yabuseo. I said, okay, this must be hello. So then I would ask my Korean uh, you know, student, how do I answer to that? Then they say, Anyonyaseo. So now I'm working on Chinese a little bit. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. Well, you're you're it's truly just, a lifelong learner. You know, you're always embracing like, uh, yeah, okay, I, what am I learning right now? You you mentioned, and I, I think when you say, I love teaching high school. Um, as a father of a high schooler, uh, I can tell you there are challenging moments, but there's such there's something about that age that's so beautiful. I don't want to give the answer to what I appreciate about it, but what would you say you love the most about that age for young people? Just relating to them and just being there for them because they look for support. They look... Uh, I, I have... Uh, uh, kept all my notes from my students that they have given me at the end of the year, Mm. thanking me for something. And I think, what did I do? Maybe I just walked by the desk and asked them how they are today. And that's all they wanted. And they thought it was so wonderful that I cared for them. And Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and other episodes I've had, for example, the the, uh, girls would come into the classroom and with the styles that they have nowadays, you know, they're kind of provocative looking. So I would turn up the air conditioner, <laughs> and they say, "And they say, Senora Herza, this it's cold here." I said, "I know it. There's something wrong with the air conditioner." <laughs> I said, "Why don't you bring a little jacket?" Oh my gosh! So, and it's funny. Some of them played on it. Came in with ski clothes, and, all that. <laughs> and I said, "That's wonderful. That's perfect for this." And then they, you would see them leave my classroom, and all the jackets would come off. You oh know, my gosh. I was the only one in the high school of three thousand students. <laughs> oh my gosh! How but I loved it. You know, yeah. I was strict. I did. I was demanding, but I also understood, and I was helpful. Mm-hmm. You said something I think important. They're they're looking for that connection. They're yeah. looking for yeah. Yeah. someone. My wife is a, is a nurse at the local school district here, and she tells stories about these these kids that feel like they're just kind of not getting what they need at home, exactly. and they're sort of frequent flyers through the exactly. office system. And a lot of administrators go, "Oh, that's a frequent flyer," and they just sort of put them in a category of high maintenance. But those kids are like they're they're crying out for help. Like I need something I'm not getting somewhere else. You know, we had uh, teachers that just would come in and teach. They didn't pay any attention to the yeah. students. And the students are craving for just a one-on-one kind of situation. Mm-hmm. And I guess I, I saw the need, and I and I loved working with them. Yeah, the teaching. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine is just retiring from teaching, uh, I think two days ago, a couple of days ago, it was her like 37 years in teaching, and I asked her, I wanted her to be on the podcast, because I think... There, these things are tradition. Like here, you taught for fifty years, and there's there's something changing about that. You, yeah, the human spirit needs to know that someone cares about me, that someone's going to support me, Absolutely. someone's there for me. Absolutely. And I think, unfortunately, these this generation is challenged with technology, which is such a great asset, but is also a great sort of piece that overwhelms them with like. Who's there for me? The people who are liking my Instagram and my Facebook and my Snapchat? Yes. Or is a teacher there for me, a parent there for me, a mentor there for me? And, you know, with us, with, uh, what's happening with families and all that, it's hard to give, find all that at home. You know? Yeah. It's getting more and more difficult all the time, I think. And yet, you know, we tell the truth, but there's hope. So yeah. what would you say is like your hope for young people? And your, for you, you can even just think of for your own grandkids as you... You know, what is your hope for them? You know, look at both sides. Don't just push one agenda. You know, be listen to other people. And, uh, you know, you weigh on your experience, what you have gone through, and see what you would like to see. Just not be all um, one-sided. That's, uh, you know, like I said to Miley, I said, Look at both sides. Look at both sides of the of the politics, mm-hmm. and just choose the, choose the best, and be the kindest person you can be, mm-hmm. and care. And uh, Nani and, and my son are so good as people, showing caring. I'm so proud of them for that. Mm-hmm. They're following. Uh, <laughs> And this is part of the, like, both sides. And I think is one of the most challenging things in life is to truly try to see the world through someone else's perspective. Yes. It's, it's one of my, like, if I could have a wish, it'd be to see me through my wife's eyes. 
Yeah. You know, like how yeah. would that be? Or when you talk about perspective, like what is a teacher's perspective now? And, and the kids and the administrators and the people who have to say we're doing distance learning and where COVID has forced into this or whether it's a politician or whether it's a police officer or whether it's like yes. how do we and, and it's impossible for us to fully do but it's a lifelong quest to do that it is it is it just we'll have to learn and and, and see what what would all come out and where we end up with this mm -hmm. and where i'm hoping for the best yeah in, in it, this and is this not is enough. America, you know, it's always a good positive thing. You know, I, I appreciate that perspective because like I say, America isn't who, it's not a politician, it's not a, it's not a, a specific, specific tax code or policy or law, it's, it's an entity, it's, a, it's an opportunity, it's, and it's changing all the time. And yeah, yes. there are changes that need to yes. be made and yes. there's good things happening, but, but what it's trying to be, and it's like heart of hearts of this country is something beautiful that we all contribute to. And, and you know we can we can uh, uh, contribute and um, and add to it, and you cannot do it in other countries. Mm -hmm. You know this is the only country where you can express your point, and you're not going to be jailed or killed or put away for it. Mm -hmm. You can live. You know they mm -hmm. give you the opportunity. You don't get that in other countries. Yeah, and hopefully there's more of those countries out there because that human spirit. Of, yes. And the journey of life, you know, our, our company is Odyssey. It's a journey marked with notable occurrences. And in that, this is not enough time for this question. So just hang on a sec here, okay? Give it, give me just, just in a word or a sentence, what are some of the highest points of your life? Like things that you remember, like that was the, the happiest day. That was an, an amazing moment. And what are some of the lowest points where you just thought, wow. I'm the highest point when I found out I was pregnant. Hmm. And the... My son was born. That was with our little Jonas? That is my highest point in my life. <laughs> my lowest point was um, leave, you know, leaving Lithuania and going mm. through the war and all that. At one time, my mother and I were in a bomb shelter. We came out and everything was level. Wow. You don't know where to go. You know, all the street signs are gone. The buildings are gone. It just all a mess and you have to find your way out wow and that was scary you know we're sitting in the bomb shelters you know it's, it's you hear the bombs going off and it's so scary that's such a for me it, it's a it's a metaphor to what is happening right now you know we've all been hunkered down and we're starting to come out and we're like where are the street signs? Where are the things that used to be familiar? Where is that business that's now closed? Yes. Where is that, the school that I used to just laugh and play and have all this and now I have to have my mask on and I have to do this or the business and, and we're all trying to find our way together. Yes. And in yes. that lowest point for you, that was also what led you to come here, yes. meet yes. The, yes. The, the father of Jonas and you know this high point. And, it's all connected. It's so challenging to embrace the low point, knowing that it's a part of the path yeah, that gets you yeah. to the high points. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Like when I went through the divorce too, I told uh, Jonas, the only thing that will save us in our relationship is if we're, if we're honest with each other. And we have done that. Mm -hmm. Honesty can be painful and yes. scary for people. True, true, deep honesty. Yeah. Um, but it's necessary. <laughs> yeah. Well, what a privilege to get to sit down with you for just a little I, bit. And thank you. And uh, I heard, as I said, you're a wonderful person. And thank you for taking such good care of Jonas and his family. Well, we... It, it's greatly, yeah. greatly appreciate. You never know how much. Really well, fun. the entire team at Odyssey loves him dearly. Our clients love him. You know, we are a family and we're you know, coming out of the bunker together. It's been a challenging year, I think, for all of us, it, not only with COVID and all that, but of course, trying to love Jonas and Nani as she's faced her, her battle with cancer and um, and support the kids. And of course, every we're all connected yeah, in the struggles. Yeah, and that's that wonderful that you're giving that opportunity for, you know, the families and all that in your business. Yeah. yeah. Well, in the spirit of you go first, you know, you've, you've gone first to, to <laughs> create this amazing guy and uh, he contributes so much to Odyssey, which we're trying to change the world and we're trying to 
I help think people. What you're doing is fantastic. Wow. Just fantastic. Well, thank you. Oh. To all of our listeners out there, I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today and the privilege to get to sit down with you and hear a little of your story. I hope you'll come back, honestly. I want to know more. Thank you. And now that you've taken a chance on this side of the mic, maybe in, in traveling home, I know you're going home today, you'll be, oh, I could have told that story. Or, oh, I wish I had <laughs> oh, said yes, that. Oh, yes, of or, course, of course. Um, you know, Ross is in here capturing the magic, and I'm just so thankful to get to yeah. finally well, connect with you. you and hear more of your story. And thank you very much. You're so welcome. So uh, on behalf of everybody at Odyssey, and you go first, and stories from the Odyssey, uh, we appreciate you so much. Thanks for being here. Do I appreciate you? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening to another episode of You Go First. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to listen to another episode, you can find us at yougofirst.live or you can see more about our host, Lane Hensley, on his Instagram at One Dream Chaser. To learn more about his company, Odyssey Teams Inc., go to odysseyteams.com or follow all their social media channels at Odyssey Teams. Thanks again, and we hope that you will go first to share our podcast with a friend or colleague. Now, you go first. Don't forget to like us on the button below. Follow us by clicking the bell. You'll get all future episodes, as well as you can certainly find the podcast on the audio version everywhere where podcasts are found. So we're looking forward to the next episode. We've got a lot of really exciting guests coming up. Thanks for watching.